We're live. Yeah, okay, we're live. Rather, rather than it starting with, hello, this is Brother Luke, Sensitive Preacher, and welcome to this, I thought we'd start with something a little bit refreshing today. We're live. <laughs> you know, Brother, I, I actually changed that last time. I started off by saying, uh, we're live. Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Wow. Yeah. Well, so so it was, that was a partial change, and here was the full change. Yes. Um, welcome to this episode of uh, Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, this is Wisdom Wednesday. Uh, we're going through the book of Proverbs, uh, and the panelists, uh, you can just call us the wise guys. Uh, or at I least love that. <laughs> at least we're, we're trying to get wiser by studying Proverbs. Uh, mm -hmm. Chapter one. Uh, is, Remember, there's three of us, so we're like the three wise men going to see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very good. Um, at least uh, we're going to try to show some wisdom today, and hopefully, we will be growing in more and more wisdom. But uh, uh, if, if you missed uh, part one, uh, that would be Proverbs chapter one. Uh, that's uh, we did last Wednesday. It's already uploaded on my YouTube channel, so you can go back and watch that if you like. We're going to move on to chapter two now, but first let me ask the, the, the panelists to say hi to everybody. And uh, Jackson, you go ahead and go. All right. Hello. My, my name is Jackson. Um, I, turned 20, I turned 23 on April 24th. So I just got a new 3DS XL for my birthday, and I'm really excited about it. And, of course, that's what our whole Bible talk is going to be, at, be on, the, the, the chapter on video games, especially handheld consoles. And I have it. I have in my hand the very first. I'll even show it the very first um, new 3DS exclusive called Xenoblade Chronicles 3D. Only for the new 3DS, terribly named product, by the way, because the new, it was the 3DS. Now it's the new 3DS. I, I have in my hand. It just came in the mail, and I went and grabbed the package when I said I'd be right back to get it. But Sorry, I accidentally muted myself. Despite the fact that I'm overjoyed about this, I'm also dying right now of jealousy against Brother Bill right now. Because Brother Bill lives in England where they released the new 3DS standard size with changeable faceplates, where we only got the XL model here that doesn't have changeable faceplates and is a little too large to be that portable, although the, although the big screen is nice. So I, th I hope the, that maybe the proverb is going to teach me not to be so envious right now, because I'm just dying of envy right now. Very interesting. Okay, well, uh, Brother Jackson, uh, his channel is Mecha Wing Zero. And uh, I hope you subscribe to his channel. You can tell he loves video games, but there's a lot more to him. There's a lot more substance to this young man than just video games. Um, so uh, he, he has a great uh, Christian ministry channel. I hope you'll subscribe to it. I am a little bit worried now, though, that uh, I hope our good friend and brother Jack Smack didn't see your, your comment there, brother, because... You'll probably do for a good chastisement from him for spending wasting time on video games. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. All but right. you know what? You know what? At least he cares enough about me to chastise me. Yes, that's true. That's true. Okay, uh, I'm going to move on to Brother Bill now. And say hi. Hello. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's Bill here, the Panda Man Evangelist, and as you can tell by my name, I like to evangelize. Uh, wherever I can, whether it's on YouTube, in the streets, or even even subtle and peculiar areas that are only been known to me at the moment. But yeah, I, I do love to evangelise, and I was totally, I must say, I was totally unaware that we've got the best Nintendo game system here, you know. It makes me almost want to go and buy one, and if it went to skin, I probably would take a photograph of it. And send it to, to send it to Brother Jackson. Just yeah. that. <laughs> and by the way, let me explain to everybody. And of course, this is so relevant. The reason I can't just order one from England is because they're region locked, so it wouldn't play the games here. Maybe I'll have to immigrate to England just so I can own this game console. <laughs> well, yeah, you'll be right. If, if you immigrate to this part of England or slightly further down south, you'll be right because we still do. We still do actually get sunshine. It's quite rare in England, but at this part of England, in Essex, 
and down south, you know, Devon and Cornwall, you yeah. actually get good sunshine. Well, so you well like, like you, you, the other thing is in England, they released the XL model that I have too, which the the only advantage of the XL model is a bigger screen and better, maybe better 3D effects, but the changeable face plates, the, the, you, there are these little plates you can put on the 3DS and take them off and going with the theme of your game, and it just it just is cool beyond belief. And North America is the one region they decided not to release it in. The one region they decided not to release it is North America. So Nintendo fans are outraged, and I'm 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 on team team outrage, I guess. Not really. I still love my XL, but anyway. I think it's important to let the public know that um, um, Jackson's real reason for wanting to immigrate to England is, is to join Brother Bill in the his Christian ministry work there. Yeah. And it's just a, it would just be another blessing though for him to also have access to that. <laughs> right? Yeah. Well yeah, yeah, you gotta have a double you gotta have a double blessing in it. And I need you come away. Maybe, maybe maybe you know yeah. what? You know what? Gospel faceplates is what I'll use. I'll get faceplates for the three D S like Jason say you have John three sixteen on it. Then maybe Jack Smack will approve of it. <laughs> yeah, you'll be all right. you'll get his endorsement then and you'll be all right. And the bishop, well, you, you sh the bishop, I'm sure, will give me an endorsement too. Well, you, you know, the bishop. Whenever you say something, it is generally gets an endorsement from the bishop. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're gonna go, go into the uh, book of Proverbs now, chapter two, and uh, um, this is um, one of the things that we learn from from Proverbs. Also, is uh, to have a balance in our lives. And I think what you just saw here was an example of, hey, uh, we we are Christian ministers, and, and we love to talk about Jesus, and we we love to discuss the scriptures, um, uh, but also there there are other things in life that are also uh, important. So that we have a balanced life. Uh, we have uh, hobbies, we have families, we have work, we have all kinds of things. And uh, we have our health to take care of, so it's it's important. And this is one of the things we'll learn as we go through Proverbs: is how to have a balanced life. Let's go to uh, Proverbs chapter two. I'm going to just start reading it and uh, stop and ask you for your comments. Proverbs chapter two. My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commands with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge, and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver, and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord, and find the knowledge of God. That's a good place to stop. So uh, let me ask uh, Brother Jackson to comment on that first. Well, it's interesting how if it says if thou seekest her, as if it, like like like, I'm trying to think of the best way to to phrase this. Um, thou shalt seek her, shall understand the fear of the Lord, and find the knowledge of God. It seems to me that that the way this principle would be applied, it'd be more of an ongoing thing than just oh, I've got the knowledge of God, I've got the understanding. Like a like like the way and and that is the way like salvation is you know you get the gift of eternal life and everything, but the tense of it and the proverb of it seems to me to be something that we should be ongoingly think about and not just do one time if that makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, I wouldn't have thought to to look at it that way, but I think that's very true. I ask Brother Bill to respond to the scripture and also your comment. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm agreeing with what, what Brother Jackson just said there. But also, it says in, in in the first portion, it says, "My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hold the commands with thee." So we 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 have a, a portion there where it tells us to seek, but also a portion where where obviously Solomon is advising his son to to receive. So yeah, we seek this thing, but we've also got to be at the same time be prepared to receive this wisdom as well. Point the seeking and not receiving. Well, I, it, it's um, one of the things about proverbs, and I think we'll we'll discover that 
Proverbs was written by Solomon primarily, but not entirely. Uh, there are some of the Proverbs that are credited to other authors, uh, but it's it's not only wise, but it even is beautifully written and poetic the way. Uh, but some of these words here that really are powerful words that we should understand. What uh, not only the idea that um, um, we should be seeking knowledge, but look, it says we uh, incline thine ear unto wisdom, apply thy heart to understanding. So first we have to get an attitude, and he says, if thou criest after knowledge, and crying after knowledge, I mean, this is pretty intense desire. So the first thing he's establishing here is that you, you should really want this, and you've got to make up your mind that you're going to desire it and seek it, if thou seekest her as silver. So the first, I guess the first wise thing you can do is make up your mind that you're going to really seek after knowledge. And as Brother Jackson said, um, this is not a one-time thing where in, when we seek after salvation and we, we understand that we receive it through faith alone in Christ alone, and then we instantaneously receive it and that's settled. Well, no, I think with wisdom, it's, it's a, as Jackson said, it's an ongoing pursuit and growing in wisdom for a lifetime. Brother Jackson? Yeah, yeah, and, and and that's the way I think Proverbs in general kind of is written all through it, you know. I don't think the book of Proverbs was meant to be read just once. The, you know, the, the way I always, growing up, thought about it is there are 31 chapters in Proverbs, so it's a nice thing to do if you ever don't know where to read in your Bible and you want to do a monthly program. It's good to read a proverb each day, but... um. I think the the book of Pro, you know how there's there's a scripture somewhere I I can't remember the reference but it says basically that we should be reading the Bible more than once to learn new things. When I always whenever I think of that I think the book of Proverbs is kind of the epitome of that. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a pretty common uh, uh, practice. Uh, Brother Sam mentioned that last time, last Wednesday. And uh, he had a custom, I guess, uh, as he was a young man, his uh, young boy, his his mother, and he would go through the Proverbs together as a routine. And you're right, it's there's 31 chapters, so people say, well, let's let's read a chapter every day, and then when you're done, repeat it again and keep doing it. And uh, it's uh, that way, it really gets ingrained and deep into your mind, and uh, it, and it's. It's always there, so it becomes so accessible because you, you've really, you've really uh, ingrained it so much. Brother Bill? Yeah, yeah, I'm just in agreement with what you two are saying at the moment. You know, it's so vital that, you know, as saints that we do, you know, seek after wisdom, not only in, in prayer, but also in reading the scriptures. And I think, you know, Brother Jackson's made a good point, you know, perhaps to go through the Proverbs, you know, more than once or twice or three times or four times. You know, I've read the Bible systematically a couple of times and obviously read it you know, on and off regularly, but it would be good practice perhaps to, to, to you know, to actually read the, the Proverbs to get a better godly wisdom. You know, I thought I'd just bring this up because it's never an easy playing field being a Christian in this world and I think we meet, we really do especially at this hour we need as much godly wisdom as possible so you know I'm agreeing and, and I think that's that, that's good advice get your head in the Bible get your head in, in the Proverbs and pray that the Lord w w would give you this this godly wisdom which we so much need within the body of Christ at the moment yeah, uh, last uh, last week when I was had this discussion on chapter one with Brother Sam, uh, and um, then Bill and, and uh, I think who was it Jeffrey? Jeffrey joined us uh, later. Um, we we discussed the idea of the um, the the fear of the Lord. It says in chapter one, the fear of the Lord 
is the beginning of understanding, the beginning of knowledge, or the beginning of wisdom. And uh, we discussed that, but uh, I'd like to give Brother Jackson an opportunity to expound on how he sees this saying, the fear of the Lord. Well, I think that uh, fear often implies a reverence. Um, you know, not. I don't think it's fear like like a haunted house being afraid, like ah. But I think it's 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 a it's a specific sort of reverence that 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 maybe even cause us to tremble a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that was the conclusion that we had. It was uh, um, rather than thinking of fear in terms of like. Uh, there, there is an element of fear in terms of uh, we have to also be concerned with uh, the, the um, chastisement of the Lord uh, and, and also just the, the law of reaping and sowing. There are consequences, so we, that, that kind of a fear is, is wise. Right. That's not, that's not like horror movie fear, though. No, no. It's like, a, like, which, like, like the movie Unfriended, which is out, that Jack Smack would be ashamed of me for watching. Yes. Good movie, by the way. Let's not delay in welcoming Brother Ronnie here. Uh, Jackson, um, let's oh, all get in. I didn't in realize that was Ronnie. Hi, yeah, Ronnie. Let's, let's all get in a habit of uh, when someone else is talking, just mute our own microphone, okay? Let me ask Brother Ronnie to say hi. I'm glad you could join us, Brother. Uh, hi, guys. Uh, nice to be here, I guess. I uh, came here a little late. I had a hard time getting on, so. I'm a moron when it comes to computers, but uh, I just got computers uh, eight one, and so it's a little rough on me. That's about it. God bless you guys. All right. Well, we're happy you're here with us, and we're uh, already into the uh, fifth uh, verse of uh, chapter two of Proverbs, and I just asked Brother Jackson to comment on what it means. Um, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. In chapter 1 it said the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Uh, Brother Brother Ronnie, uh, I'd like for you to give us your idea of what you mean. This you think this means by the fear of the Lord. Okay, I had to unmute myself. Oh, fear, I think it's respect, awe, reverence. I don't think it's a terror, <clears throat> especially not from the New Testament on, the New Covenant on. Uh, but there, you know, I mean, if you do something wrong, the Holy Spirit's going to bother you. I mean, he's going to uh, chasten you. So, I mean, that kind of respect, you know, you, you don't want to be chastened. That's how the Lord, I think, chastens us now, or or that, that kind of reverence we have to have and respect. Uh, I just got chastened last night <laughs> because of uh, my anger issue. So, um, Lord hit me pretty hard. But that's the kind of thing that I, I think it is, because we're all forgiven through Christ already, uh, those who are believers in Jesus. Um, so that fear, that kind of terror of not, let's say, like obeying the Ten Commandments or you know something like that, or, or sinning, because we're not supposed to be even sin conscious, as far as I understand the New Covenant. Uh, we're supposed to walk by the Spirit, but when we step out on our own, that's when we can get in trouble. And so that's where that reverence and awe oh, kind of comes in, I think. That's about it. All right, thank you. Uh, now that uh, St. Tommy has joined us, uh, hi, brother. Um, I don't know how if, you, if you've heard anything we've said so far, but we're in Proverbs chapter 2, and we're, we're asking about this term, the fear of the Lord uh, and fine knowledge of God. And also in chapter 1 it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Uh, could you just give us your interpretation of the saying, the fear of the Lord in this case? Um, thank you for your hospitality, my brother. Um, the fear of the Lord, um, the beginning of wisdom, beginning of knowledge. Um, I'm not sure if I have anything to say about the fear of the Lord, other than I do love to follow up that proclamation, that truthful proclamation about the fear of the Lord being the beginning of knowledge, I love to follow that up with perfect love cast out all fear. Uh, so that's about all i got to say. Thank you. Thank you, though. All right. Thank you, brother. That was a, that was a really good follow-up. And that's something we have to do. And that's part of keeping everything in the right perspective. Uh, so 
before we move on, let me highlight a couple of points here. So far in chapter 2 we've established, it says, uh, this is a wise man talking to his son, my son. And he's saying that, uh, receive these words and incline thine heart to wisdom, incline thine heart to understanding, cry out for knowledge, uh, seek it at, just as you would seek silver and treasures. So uh, this is the first thing I guess that he wants his son to understand. And is that we should develop this attitude that we really desire it and we're more constantly seeking after knowledge. It's a, not a one-time effort, as Brother Jackson said. It's a lifelong pursuit of, of, of knowledge and understanding and wisdom. Okay, I'm going to move on and read a, a little bit further, um, starting with verse 6. For the Lord giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. Uh, let's stop there, just these two verses, 6 and 7. Uh, and let me ask your Brother Bill if he can comment on that first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Before I was going to comment, I just wanted to quickly, because I missed out the opportunity, yeah, just to briefly agree with, uh, you know, what, what the panelists said that, the, the fear of the Lord is reverence. It's not like fear is in all oh, this horrible God is some kind of megalomaniac want to hurt us. No, this this God is the, is the perfect God that casts about all fear, and He's the one that we should revere in love. So that, that I think surmises the the, the the point of the fear of God. As to the, these these next verses, for the Lord giveth wisdom out of His mouth. This is the breath we're talking here. That's, that's from the Holy Spirit, gives you this wisdom, right? Come with knowledge and understanding. And, and we notice the, you know, the Holy Spirit, part part of what he does is, is to reveal Christ unto us. We're talking, I know we're going jumping from Old Testament and New, but I'm trying to draw the, the comparisons in, because that, you know, that is the, at the heart of the matter, isn't it? That, that, that people get saved by Christ. And, and it's the Holy Spirit that draws people and and if we're attentive to you know to what he's saying out of his mouth, this breath of life, you know we can get this knowledge and this understanding. And at, at the end of the day, if we're honest, that the the the, the 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 pinnacle of all this understanding and all this truth and all this knowledge it is accepting Christ as Saviour. That that is what I've gleaned out of that verse in particular, as we was talking and as you was reading it. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, um, Brother Jackson, on verse 6, uh, uh, this kind of relates to me, what I did for 10 hours the last few weeks on uh, e e uh, eternal sonship uh, question, and we talked about the eternality of God and that, that um, everything came after God, everything that there is, and that I, I think this is telling us that even wisdom, it comes out, out of God, out of his mouth. And so um, if, if God has created everything, uh, then that would mean that uh, he's the, also the creator of wisdom. And uh, so is, is that what this is saying here in verse 6? Well, it's, if I'm reading correctly, this just it says that it's for the Lord giveth wisdom out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. Um, I, I, I would just say what, what, it, what it directly says is that when God speaks or when God is, is decreeing things to people, he's giving them knowledge and wisdom, right? And you make a great point about nothing being before God, so knowledge and wisdom have to come from God. I, I would argue God probably created the concept of what knowledge and wisdom even are. To, to give to us and everything. We, uh, it was pretty mind-boggling that last study uh, in terms of talking about eternality and stuff. The whole concept was, uh, for our, uh, our finite minds, really hard to understand. But I, one of the things that we were wrestling with is that did everything must have come from God? That energy, matter, every every little thing that exists, not only physical things like energy and matter, but even uh, 
kind of non-physical things like even ideas. Uh, let me ask St. Tommy to comment on that. He's, he's certainly in agreement. Yeah, I heard, uh, I heard that a man can receive nothing unless it's given to him from heaven. And if we are privileged to, to sport wisdom or understanding uh, or knowledge, uh, that it is by grace and uh, that, that it is a gift from God. I also heard that uh, whatever understanding and wisdom and knowledge that we currently sport, whatever amount when we sport it, that it is not a good replacement. For, uh, it's not reliable or a replacement for trusting in our Father. That uh, I think it says, rely not on your own understanding, but trust in me. Uh, and it can be to have a, yeah, oh, oh, and that we're well equipped wherever we're at, whatever understanding we have, that we're well equipped to do the good works that our Father has prepared for us, whether we're immature in understanding in some ways and mature in others, wherever we're at, it's by the grace of God, and we're right on time because the Holy Spirit is our teacher. And uh, even though we're not fully knowledgeable or our understanding may be shallow in ways, uh, we're right on time, his time, his time, and that it's all by grace. Amen. Uh, I, uh, Brother Ronnie, if you'd like to comment on this, I'd like to hear what you have to say about the idea that the Lord giveth wisdom. Out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. Well, it's, it, you know, the Lord says all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purposes. There's like experiential uh, knowledge that gives you understanding and which turns into wisdom that you could pass on to somebody else. Uh, <clears throat> like today, I had, had to talk to a brother <clears throat> who gave me his wisdom in order to deal with an issue that was going on here on YouTube. And if you listen, you know, because all these things do come from God. All things are from God. All things that are good come from the Lord and from above. <clears throat> uh, you know, if you listen to that and you take that to heart, the wisdom that God has given yourself or someone else, then you have understanding. Uh, <clears throat> but it's it's usually the first what a person that already went through something to get that understanding, to have that wisdom. That's why it's it's always good to listen to an elder who's been through things already. That's my point on it. Amen. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I thought it was interesting that uh, the, the Lord giveth wisdom out of his mouth cometh knowledge, but as Brother Ronnie said, sometimes we gain knowledge from the brethren. Obviously, we... we we test everything, we test all the knowledge through the scriptures. Uh, but it is possible to gain knowledge through the brethren, and I think sometimes God is using the brethren to give the knowledge. Brother Bill? Absolutely spot on, yeah. Absolutely spot on, because you do get, obviously, as Ronnie has just said, then you get uh, experiential knowledge through experiences, through life, through, through your your brothers and sisters in Christ, but even that has at some point been imparted by, by the Holy Ghost and he has given it to that person for us. And that's a blessing in itself that, you know, and that's why I believe, you know, if, if you're in some remote place and you haven't got the blessed scriptures and they are such a blessing to us, they really are in the Western world, that, 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 that the Holy Ghost can speak through someone you know, experientially and impart wisdom and knowledge from God to us. So that that is, you know, a valid point and it can be done and is done often time. Obviously my my you know, the vast majority of, of, of what we what we learn and what we, you know, absorb as Christians, especially in the Western world, comes from the Word of God because we are blessed. But, you know, in dire need I do believe still that God can and will impart, you know, his goodness, his love, his mercy, and, and his wisdom to those who will, as we said, who, as Brother Jackson said earlier, 
who will seek after him and seek after his knowledge. All right, good. Um, Brother Bill, while I have you there, uh, you are from England, aren't you? Oh, I certainly am. Yeah. It sounds like an English accent. You sound like you're, you know, these English accents are very impressive. It sounds like you're more intelligent than the, than the rest of us. So I would, I would ask you here, uh, you probably understand this uh, English language better, but when it says, he layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous, he is a buckler. I mean, I don't hear the word buckler very often today. A buckler to them that walk uprightly. I'd like to give you first chance to explain what that means by he is a buckler. Well, you, you, could, you could put it in, in simpler terms, he upholds. A buckler, well, when you have a buckle on a horse, you put your, your, your feet in the buckles, in the stirrups, and it holds you, holds you steadfast, it holds you secure. So, you know, that, that would say that, 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 that God is making you secure in this, this situation. So um, it's kind of like when I buckle up the belt on my pants, it holds my pants up, huh? <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, but, but, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, because you, yeah, the belt will buckle of, of truth, you know, within the, you know, the, the, the armor of God. But buckler, you know, generally is if you're a knight and you're sitting on your horse, you know, you kind of buckle up, you, you're kind of really held onto that horse, ready for battle. And, and I think that is a description of God holding us really fast, really tight, and ready for battle, and that being spiritual. Yeah. I, uh, I'll ask Jackson here to comment about what I'm going to say here. Is that, uh, uh, when it says he's a buckler, he holds us up, he gives us the security. I'm thinking that uh, as I gain in knowledge, I feel more um, comfortable. I feel, I feel comforted. I'm comforted in the knowledge. <laughs> right, because obviously it's a reference to losing weight, so you have to t tighten your belt buckle more and more. I I think it's just you feel really, really good when you understand something and you're not stressing over something. Yeah. It gives you this, it gives you this peace and comfort and, um, you know, there's, there's, is, is, is it in Proverbs a... Uh, Peace like a river, or joy like a fountain. And to me, when you have knowledge and you can rest, like you know, we, there's been some references to some of the strife that we've seen here recently in the body, and and, um, and so I know that a lot of people it's really getting to them, and they're all stressed out, and, and it really bothers them. But uh, I, I think uh, wisdom in in this case is being able to rest and not stress over things like that, and just trust the Lord. Lean not our own understanding, as St. Tommy said earlier, and, and being able to feel that we're buckled and secure and comfortable, and in, in, in this wisdom gives us that. Uh, Brother, uh, Brother Ronnie? Well, my mind says a buckler is like, like a shield, and that the, the Word of the Lord is like that, too. I mean, the more you read of Scripture, the more you, you understand God's truth. And so when you take that at the heart, you don't have to worry about if somebody says something different, and like evolutionists and all that other stuff, that nonsense. I mean, you have the Word of God in your heart, and that's like a shield against the nonsense, and it gives you discernment. So that's my take on it. It is a shield. I think it's a good I'll try to vouch for that, because also, as you just said that, also you know, a buckler, you know, in English terms, could be a small round shield, you know, I believe that bucklers, if I'm correct, are shields that were actually used as weapons too, because like, they're oh. small enough to be able to hit the enemy with. They're 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 for defense too. Don't get me wrong, but I remember hearing that they that like they dub because of their their small like compact size, they doubled as a weapon too. I don't think it's the same type of shield that Ronnie has behind him on the wall, which looks very cool, by the way. Yeah. Uh. I would ask your brother Bill. You know, I, I depend on brother Bill uh, for a lot. But uh, if you could uh, give us any insights in any other translations, we—I uh, I know that uh, at least at least several of us are what we call King James firstist. We always want to look at King James first, 
but we don't want to be limited because maybe we can learn something from looking at some modern translation that could be helpful too. And so uh, we, if there's something in the modern translation that would be enlightening to this term, because the, the buckler, you guys have expressed a lot of ideas on buckler, and uh, I find it very interesting, but maybe we can learn something from modern translations. Brother Bill can dig that up for us. Let me ask St. Tommy to comment on this now. Um, I heard that the understanding is like seven bodyguards in a city. Very valuable. Um, but maybe not valuable for everything. Um, I've heard that understanding is more valuable than gold. And gold is valuable, but not valuable for everything. Um, uh, knowledge puffeth up, but love builds up. Um, I'll tell you, I don't know of any better hobby than to deliver understanding of grace to other children, to other children like me, delicate and and uh, frequently frightened children like me. It's great. It's a great hobby. It's beautiful. And I long and pine to deliver the understanding of whatever quality that I have. It's so good to deliver and fun and reassuring. Understanding of grace, oh, helps with fear management and the fear does come in waves continuously um, uh, but again I remind myself that uh, that our, our understanding is not is 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 not completely deep or completely full yet and as assuring as it is the understanding that I behold it will fail it will it will uh, become foggy at times and ultimately as valuable as it is understanding of grace of our Christ Jesus of who we are in him as as beautiful as that is relying on him and beholding him and who we are in him that that ultimately is is where where the peace is Understanding of grace, oh, it helps. Understanding helps. But sometimes, even with all my intellectual understanding that I am safe, that he is in control, that it is finished, with all my understandings of grace, even my understanding of such truthful things, I just got to toss it all to him. Mm, thank you. Yeah, I think that that's good. I'm, I, I always appreciate the perspective, and you've put perspective uh, already a couple of times in the, into the conversation. And as you're talking, it it, um, it took me to I, I, the love chapter. I think it's First Corinthians chapter seven, and Paul put it all in perspective there. Maybe someone could pull part of that up in talking about how love is uh, more important than all these other things. Uh, let me ask. Uh, uh, brother, uh, brother Jackson, to respond if he has something to say on this. On this verse seven, you're saying? Uh, on on uh, Tommy's uh, comment and uh, and the idea. I, I thought Tommy's comment was spot on. I hardly want to to say too much to modify it. So I I, I just really 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 agreed with that. Hmm. Tommy is so good. He can't even be like edited and improved. Very good. Okay. Uh, how about uh, brother Ronnie? You're muted, brother. We can't hear you. You're muted. Okay. My okay now. Hear me? Okay. I, I remember talking to Brother Luke uh, one day about uh, all of us. No matter how intelligent we get or how much we think we know, God is omniscient, <laughs> and we must look like retards, you know. But still, He loves us, and still, with all of our uh, faults, you know, He sent Jesus Christ to die for us. I mean, that's the most Tremendous thing I can ever come up with. Uh, that he, he he loves us, you know, no matter what we are, no matter where we've been, what we've done. Uh, he still loves us, you know. It, it, but think of that, an omniscient God, you know, He knows everything. I mean, Jesus Christ holds all things together, you know, and uh, even while He was here. So I mean, that that really smokes my mind. 
the gods like that. Okay. Yeah, this the love is uh, it is uh, when we always fall back on that. Uh, I mean, if we look at S Solomon's life, you know, here he is. He prayed for wisdom, and he got it. And through wisdom, he gained wealth and fame and all this other stuff. But we know at the end of his life, uh, there was a lot of problems. And uh, so uh, even wisdom doesn't, you know, as St. Tommy says, even wisdom can fail you right? because we're not going to be completely wise. As Brother Ronnie said, uh, only God is completely omniscient. Brother Bill, can you talk about the buckler, the various translations, and also the love chapter? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The buckler, the, the the general consensus is, as you know, we we are coming coming to realise it is a shield. Okay, but like I said, the emphasis to see that the emphasis is something that holds fast. You know, if if you look at the language, I'm looking at that. Uh, that, that, that within the Hebrew lexicon at the moment, and it is something that, that holds us fast, holds us secure, and, and is you know able and act to you know. And I suppose it, in in New Testament terms, you know, to as the armor of God, you know, keep away them fiery darts. And you know, I suppose this is we really need, especially what's been going on recently, we really need wisdom because there there is darts coming left, right, and centre at the moment. You know, and, and the gospel is under siege. You know, our characters are under siege. Everything is under siege. But I suppose that the comfort in all this is that, that Christ is our buckler, he is our shield, and he is our very great reward. So just hold fast, saints. You know, hold fast to Christ. You know, he, he is our defense in this. You know, and, and I, I'm guilty as well. I've been carried away with myself trying to use my own common sense you know worldly wisdom to deal with situations and i'm guilty of that when i really should have and ought to have relied on on, on christ's wisdom in this sense and he being my shield and my wisdom in these circumstances but that's the consensus it's a shield it's secure it's safe and we're out of danger just rest and and lean on that shield and i've got i have to say before i quickly go off i am enjoying the ronnie's shield axe and mace in the background <laughs> i have to say <laughs> uh, are you are you able to uh read the portion of uh first corinthians 7 i think of the, the the end about love how the perspective of how love is greater than these other virtues can i throw oh, something in right? yeah go ahead ronnie uh i'm ordered into bed <laughs> today so i'm in my bed sitting up in my bedroom so that's why you see all this nonsense behind me, okay? <laughs> it's not something I put up in the house. But, well, it's not nonsense. But Except for the flower, that's my granddaughter. All right, brother. That same uh, uh, painting there uh, depicting Jesus, I'm not saying it's a picture of Jesus, because we don't know, except for maybe the Shroud of Turin, I, if that's if that's true I, I I tend to believe that Shroud of Turin is correct but uh, that might be the best picture of Jesus but there's been a lot of artist renderings of Jesus and that's one that I've had also in my house uh, over the years too um, but brother Bill can you uh, do you have that available the love chapter oh, are you 1 Corinthians 13 are you talking about I thought it was chapter 7 but it says chapter 13 and go ahead if you, if you got the little portion uh, I think that any chance we have to look at that, then uh, I think it's always beneficial. Yeah, I, I, thought, I assumed, I can read a few passages, but I assumed you was on about 1 Corinthians chapter 13, because that's obviously the love chapter. Yes, yes, please do. I'll, I'll just read it, I'll just this word. And, and it starts off, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not charity, which is love, I have become a sound brass, or a tingling symbol. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not charity, which is love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, which is love, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity if endeth not, you know, this is envieth not. Charity if vaunteth not, 
itself is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part and prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. But now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know as I am known. And now abide it, faith, hope, charity. These three, but the greatest of these is charity, which is love. Yeah. Well, St. Tommy introduced the idea that uh, the knowledge will will fail, but love is uh, uh, supreme. And, and uh, then when we see that chapter, one of the most famous, beautiful chapters, I, I could hardly compose myself listening to that. It's just, it's so beautiful. And you talk about wisdom. Is there anything more wise ever written than that? And uh, so as we're seeking knowledge, we're seeking understanding, we're seeking wisdom. But the greatest wisdom really is understanding that uh, that love, the love God has for us. And then scripture says, we love him because he first loved us. So it's, it's a natural response when we understand his love for us, we love him. And then he asks us, will you love your fellow man? That's what he asks of us. And so uh, let me welcome Brother Sam and, and say hi and uh, respond to anything you heard so far, Brother Sam. Hey guys, um, sorry I'm, I was late. I was caught up uh, with lunch and uh, um, I wasn't able to hear anything. <laughs> so, uh, where are we? Probably uh, chapter 2, probably, somewhere. Proverbs chapter 2, but Brother Tommy, uh, introduced the idea that uh, love supersedes wisdom. So, it I decided we should go to the love chapter, and that's why Brother brother Bill just read the love chapter in 1 Corinthians, uh, saying that uh, you can have all kinds of knowledge, but uh, it doesn't do any good if you don't have love. So you can react to that, and then we'll, we'll move on to the next verse. Yeah. Um, that's, uh, I think the different version uh, have a different way of putting it, uh, KJV. I believe uh, it puts it as charity, whereas other versions they put it as love. And I do make uh, two, I think there are a little difference, uh, if not a lot. I think the, uh, the result of compassion, you know, like the, uh, like the Good Samaritan, I think that's charity. Uh, going, uh, you know, going to two miles, three more miles, four more miles with your friend. I think that's kind of charity. When you feel compassion towards uh, that person, um, I think it's a little different than just the love, just love that we generally understand. At least for me, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, I may be uh, misunderstanding this. Uh, English not being my uh, native language. But I think I, I see uh, a clear distinction between charity and love. Uh, and love, I would say that you could, I don't know, I feel that's a little lighter. Maybe we use that a lot too much. Uh, whereas charity is, I, I feel that's from our heart, our, from our compassion, so to say. I don't know if, if I'm making any sense. Well, I, I think there is a, a, a distinction, but to me, the, the uh, charity is the acting out of love, the demonstration of love. So uh, you're not going to be charitable unless you have love, because love is causes causes you to be charitable. But uh, we, I think, most of us would think, even though we are KJV firstist, uh, uh, you may draw a clear distinction between charity and love, but 
I think uh, at least Bill and I, uh, I we would, we probably use them interchangeably. Think of in this in this case, charity meaning being translated as love. But uh, let me ask Brother Bill to comment on that. What was that? What the, the, the distinction between charity and love? Or are they interchange really interchangeable? That, that is, it's one and the same word. You know, in the original Greek, and obviously translated in Old English, charity was love. So that that is one and the same word. All right. Um, let, uh, does anybody want to say anything else on, on what we just covered before I move on to the next verse? If you do, just unmute right now. Okay. All right, we'll move on then. Okay, so now we're on chapter 2, verse um, 7. No, no, uh, verse 8. He keepeth the paths of judgment and preserveth the way of the saints. Then shalt thou understand righteousness and judgment and equity, yea, every good path. All right. Um, let me ask Jackson. He hasn't spoken for a while. He, I, I don't even believe he's still there. He's been so silent. Go ahead, Jackson. I am still here. Um, when it comes to charity and love, I, I think they're the same. Um, I, I think uh, there might be a slight nuance in the English language between the two words, but... Um, I suppose I don't have anything more to say about that point. Uh, what about the verse I just read? Uh, it was verse 8. He keepeth the paths of judgment and preserveth the way of the saints. Oh, okay, that's what you were asking me about. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, believe it or not, I take this as an eternal security passage. Um, I, I, I know that that's very, very jack smack of me to, to say... But, um, you know, if God is preserving those that are his, how could you ever lose your salvation? In the recent video you made on eternal security, I think this principle is right there. Very interesting. Uh, okay. Uh, let me ask. Uh, well, we got enough people on the panel now. I, I'd like to ask anybody who just like, just wave your hand if you're anxious to say something and I'll call on you rather than trying to, I'm trying to be, make sure that everybody has an opportunity to speak, but if someone's anxious, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to fundamentally agree with what Brother Jackson said, you know, reading that and, and that, that cries out eternal security. I mean, it really does. He keep of the paths, not, not we keep of the paths. It's not our righteousness, it's Christ's righteousness. That's all of him, and it always has been, always will be. And, and, and I think that really speaks volumes, that, that one verse. So amen uh, to, to what you just said, Jackson, and amen to uh, this Christ we serve is, is keeping us secure and on his path, regardless of our frailties and our foibles. Amen. I, I think that uh, what you and Jackson have said about this, it makes me feel really very buckled in now. I got my seatbelt buckled on now. Exactly. You're on your horse. You've got your shield ready. <laughs> You're ready for battle. Okay. Um, let me ask Brother Ronnie, do you have any insights on, on this? Uh, the idea of uh, uh, Jackson says he sees this as a, as a uh, type of uh, eternal security verse. He keepeth the paths of judgment and preserveth the way of the saints. No, I'm not going to add to that. I think that was very well done. Very well said. It, it's kind of hard to add to Jackson usually, he, and and, and St. Tommy's been said, doing the same thing. It, people are speechless. He's making a comment, and then we are speechless. There's no response. How can you add to that? Brother Tommy wants to say something right now. Go ahead. Uh, I tell you, it is very edifying for me to behold Christ Jesus in all you brothers, especially you, Brother Bill. Um, at times, it's so easy. <laughs> you make it easy. Um, but anyway, uh, he keep he keeps the paths of judgment. Thank God, thank God that he has taken our judgment, the judgment that we deserved uh, for all our transgressions, and he has taken our punishment right down to the death penalty. 
he has preserved the path, the righteous paths of judgment. He is righteous in making us righteous. He, it is just. Um, thank God, thank God, he has taken our judgment, and he has separated us from our sin as far as the east is from the west. Even as we grow, even as we mature, out of our folly, out of our even as our mind is being renewed out of its youthful folly, he has, has saved us and his paths of judgment are preserved and are just. Amen. Amen. Now, I ask uh, Brother Sam uh, if you, if you uh, think that this, as, as everybody seems to agree, that we can interpret this as uh, eternal security here. Yeah, most definitely. You're talking about verse 8, right? Yeah. Of yeah. course. Preserved, I mean, you know, not only um, preserved the way for us, uh, but also he says he keeps path of judgment. And and basically he's uh, protecting us all the way. Uh, so it backs up the uh, eternal security. Yes. Mm-hmm. I love the word preserve. Uh, right, right. It should say, it doesn't say, there, there are two things it doesn't say. Number one, it doesn't say, and he makes us persevere to the end against our will in the righteous way. Um, for, the, for the people who say you automatically will persevere to the end. And it also doesn't say he fails to preserve us. He tries, but he often fails and, and loses us for the people who think you can lose their salvation. That's what I think I would have to say if either of those were true. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've, I've used this illustration before, but just the idea of preserves. You know, if someone makes homemade preserves and they 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 preserve the fruit, they put it in the jar and they seal it and they put wax around it and stuff, and then and then when it comes time to open it up, it's it's preserved and it, it's just as good and it's uh it's preserved until the day of redemption. It's sealed. Until the day of redemption. No, bro, sometimes it's um, it's better when it's, things are preserved. One thing that I want to point out is that uh, uh, preserving is God, what God's doing. God is doing the preserving, yeah. right? Whereas in Calvinism, it says um, persevere, and, yeah. and, and saints are, yep. uh, are do uh, persevere. You know, there's Ooh. a difference between the work of God and the work of man. And here, here is another passage that defeats the Calvinism. Yep, it, it certainly does. And Luke, I was going to ask you, did you come up with that um, that analogy about the preserves in the in the in the in the jar uh, on your own? No, I think that was from Curtis Hudson. If I, remember. I was going to say it's because Curtis Hudson came up with that. So I was going to say, wow, that'd be a coincidence if you came up yeah. with it. You know where Curtis Hudson came up with it in his book, Why I Disagree with All Five Points of Calvinism, under the P is where he says that. Yeah. Yeah, it's beautiful. Curtis Hudson is one of my all-time favorite preachers, but now I got another favorite. This guy that uh, Brother Bill just po posted. What was his name, Bill? That he posted just uh, yesterday. Uh, that's that's bro Brother Malcolm Smith, and and he's although sometimes he can be a bit, a little bit liturgical, he's really an excellent. I tell you, he, he gets the gospel in ways that. That I'm still trying to grasp, and it's such a blessing to see, you know, watch him. And, and I, I, I've said this before, perhaps offline and off a live debate, but I, I, I might as well say it now while we're online. It was listen a, 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 a snippet from a Brother Malcolm Smith's sermon, a different one entirely, about seven, eight years ago, that, that opened my eyes to the gospel of grace. You know, I was yeah, I was in religionity. I believed in Christ, and and I was saved according to him, perhaps because God is righteous, we're not, and He's faithful, we're not. But that was a real eye opener when, when Brother Malcolm Smith taught a, a little message on, on repentance, what it means. Because I was, you know, silly, and and I, I told the churchianity line and 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 the Lordship salvation line that repentance means to turn away from sin and everything else. And he and he came out with a Greek in such a loving manner, and such a kindly way, that that it, the penny dropped. And I understood that this repentance that we're supposed to do, is to just really just change our minds. 
and believe on this Christ. That's how much I, I really endorse Melton Smith, and, and I would recommend anyone out there, you know, if you want to listen to a, a, a preacher that is full of grace, full of love, and full of Christ, you know, listen to him. I tell you, it's amazing. Yeah. Uh, if if anybody has not uh, seen the video that uh, Brother Bill just uploaded a couple of days ago, uh, Brother Bill advertised it as one of the best sermons he's ever heard. And I thought he might have been using hyperbole, but when I when I uh, listened to it, uh, I certainly agree. It's definitely one of the best. So uh, I'm a fan, Malcolm Smith fan, and as uh, Brother Jackson said, Curtis Hudson. Curtis Hudson is definitely one of my all-time favorites uh, preachers too. Um, all right, let me uh, let me go on here to this end of this verse. Unless if you're someone has something urgent to say before I move on, wave your hand so I know you want to talk. Uh, okay, uh, now it says, "Then shalt you understand righteousness and judgment and equity, yea, every good path." When wisdom entereth into thine heart, and knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul, oops, he's got it ended there. I better go to my notes. Uh, discretion shall preserve thee, understanding shall keep thee, to deliver thee from the way of the evil man, from the man that speaketh froward things. Uh oh. Uh oh. Darn Solomon's opened up a can of worms now, hasn't he? Um, uh, Brother Bill, if you, maybe you can post those those uh, latest comments there. Okay, there you go. Yeah, just, just, just post that. And, and I just thought I'd mention that, that, that when you was uh, mentioned that, that he's opened a can of worms there, you know, I thought he had a, you know, opened up a can of worms earlier when, when he was reading... That was a uh, what was it? Uh, oh man, I think it was first nine. What was the first five? So I was I was meandering there. Sorry, forgive me, but that had come to me again eventually. But yeah, there, there was a can of worms opened early, and I kept my mouth shut, and they've just opened up an even bigger can of worms. Yeah, and we're looking at verses 9, 10, 11, and 12. And so in context, I'll read it all in context, and I'd like Brother Ronnie, if you could listen to this, Brother Ronnie, tell me your uh, gut feeling about this. Then shalt thou understand righteousness and judgment and equity, yea, every good path. When wisdom entereth into thine heart, and knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul, discretion shall preserve thee, understanding shall keep thee to deliver thee from the way of the evil man, from the man that speaketh froward things. Brother Ronnie, did we lose, uh, we lost uh, St. Tommy, huh? Okay, go ahead, Brother Ronnie. I guess maybe he had to step away, so. Uh, uh, Sam, are you there? Yeah, um, basically the verse is uh, pretty much um, explaining uh, how God uh, will preserve saints, um, basically through understanding uh, righteousness, judgment, equity, uh, discretion. Um, all these methods uh, God will be using uh, to preserve saints. So I'm sure, I'm sure um, he has his purpose for each one of us. And I think I kind of mentioned that, uh, you know, like when you were saying preserving jam, you know, sometimes, like in, in, in kimchi, for example, <laughs> you know, it's an acquired taste. It's a Korean vegetable uh, side dish, spicy. Oh, but, that's what you mean by jam. I heard it like the preserve me jam, like a dance move or something. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> no, no. You have to do the preserve me jam. We should make a, a spoof video about that now. <laughs> I just misheard that. You mean like jam, like like the fruit jam, right? Right, strawberry yeah. jam. Okay, continue. Sorry, that's just, just too funny right. for you to say. Or kind of like you know when things get fermented, you know, like like in kimchi, when when you age things, it, things can you know tends to get better 
you know, and like cheese, like some stinky cheese or something. Sometimes when you preserve things uh, right, correctly, truly, you know, you get that yummy stuff. I think that's what uh, I think. The, I think what the passage, I mean, the verses are, to are talking about how God uh, will preserve us and to be yummy, yummy, yummy saints. Well, it it seems like uh, Sam. Remember when we were talking in chapter one about the idea of not associating with the bad people, not getting uh, uh, drawn away with peer pressure to go out and do bad things with a gang, and um, and th this is kind of a, it's going to be a theme throughout all the proverbs is saying if you're wise, you'll avoid these kinds of people. And now this is referencing a certain type of purple, a person, the man that speaketh froward things. Brother Bill, uh, what is froward? I think it means evil. Yeah, no, yeah, sorry, I was muted there. I was I'll just explain what froward was and I was muted. Sorry, I'm doing a I'm doing a loop there, sorry for that. But froward basically means to you know, someone who's difficult or contrary, always causing, you know, controversy. You know, that, that would be a froward person. You, you avoid them sort of people. A difficult, a, of a person difficult to deal with, contrary. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's what I just said. Yeah, yeah. So controversial, contrary, yeah, yeah. Pretty much the same vein. So when it says contrary, you know, what, what you know, what is in contrary to, you know, in this case, you know, when these guys are speaking of fr uh, fraud things, maybe they're in, uh, they're speaking contrary to the will of God. Well, yeah, contrary to the will of God and contrary to the word of God, yep. Yeah. Right. Yeah, well, I think well, we have all can give examples of... Um, uh, meeting that that type of man that speaketh froward things, and this is saying that uh, through wisdom, knowledge, and uh, all these things that we're hopefully we're going to acquire this kind of wisdom and understanding, so that to deliver thee to deliver thee from the way of the evil man. So we'll be wise to know how to deal with these people. And one of the things that I've said a lot, especially lately is that the way you deal with that kind of a person is you name them and then uh, separate from them. You divide. You do not associate with them. And that's something we're going to learn. It's a, it's a theme all throughout Proverbs is do not associate with those people. Once you identify this froward man, it's wise to, to name them and say, I won't associate with them. Brother Ronnie, you're muted. Yeah, I'm sorry. I missed just about everything you said. The hospital just called me, and I had to go in the other room and talk. Um, i got to make a couple of calls. I have no idea what you talked about. Uh, i got to talk to my ex and my son real quick. But I'll, I'll be right back on when All I'm right, done. Come back when you get a chance. Okay, fine. Okay. Okay. Uh, Brother Jackson, uh, what do you think of this froward man and how to deal with the froward man? Well, really, what it rem the first thing it reminds me of is Romans sixteen seventeen, which says to mark and avoid them which cause divisions. And uh, let, let me just read what it says: mark and avoid them that cause divisions, and offenses contrary to the doctrine you should have learned, and avoid them. But but it seems like you know, as 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 unpopular as this may be with some people, if somebody is going around, you know, who wants to cause problems and wants to make false accusations especially and 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 ultimately wants to preach a false doctrinal message you know you you cut them off you avoid them. I've um, I think I've learned to apply that principle uh, a few years back uh, and, and I, I've been as I, I've said this before in eight years on YouTube I've already blocked approximately 400 people, and so there. I know there's at least 400 people that I would say this is a froward man. This is somebody that uh, I need to uh, mark and avoid. Um, uh, I'm glad I did, because I get a lot more peace by not trying to 
you know, deal with that person, but just identifying them and saying, I, I'm going to avoid them. And uh, so it's worked well for me following that principle. You know, I don't have all wisdom, but at least I acquired enough wisdom to, to apply that principle. Brother Bill? Yeah, yeah, and, and I said I spoke to you privately a few weeks ago, and I said I'm adopting the same principle, and so far I'm up to about 50 people I've blocked already. But, but you know, it's slightly on the same vein. It may not be as harsh, but on the same vein, when Brother Jackson was saying, you know, the, the quote in the verse in Romans, that straight away came to my head was that verse in Rome, in Titus chapter 3. And that's verse 10 that says... It says a man that is an heretic after the second admonition reject, and 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 then I don't think that is whether they're a heretic or they're someone who's been froward. I think that's a reasonable and wise decision to make. You know, give them a couple of chances, but after that, you you have to for your own sanity, I suppose, and for the sake of, of younger brethren around you who look up to you. Who, who want a clear and concise gospel, you need to, whether it's hard or not, to reject. You know, until either that they come back to the fold, you know, they shake, you know, shake out whatever they're doing, or, or, or whatever. You know, I think, yeah, you know, the old saying, you know, on the third strike, you're out. So two strikes and you're out would be a, a wise decision, and, and I see a biblical decision to make. All right. Anything else needs to be said about verses nine through twelve? And okay, I'll I'll move on to uh, verse thirteen. Who leave the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness? Who rejoice to do evil and delight in the frowardness of the wicked? Whose ways are crooked and they are froward in their paths to deliver thee from the strange woman well let's not go into the women yet let's talk about this this is elaborating further on this type of person there's a froward uh what was that definition that i put up there earlier I may just avoid it because it's it's a bit too contrary you know to always oppose basically so if you say something like I think apples are nice and red this year. They would say, no, no it's not. not. You're so wrong. Apples aren't yeah, nice exactly. and reddish. Exactly. And that, that's contrary, and that, that is what they do. And that is, believe it or not, we, we, we're seeing a lot of, you know, on YouTube land at the moment. It's very contrary, kind of antagonistic, you know, haughty attitude. I'm going to have to start a, a whole group against Bill now because he said apples are nice and reddish. The <laughs> yeah, you're to be, apple heresy. <laughs> you're going to be, yeah, the green, the green apple heresy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, if we think of Froward as being somewhat contrary and disagreeable, uh, as we read further here, it seems that there's it's even much worse than, than we thought. Uh, it says... The, to deliver thee from the way of the evil man, the the man that speaketh froward things. So being froward is actually evil. To leave the path of uprightness, to walk in the ways of darkness, to rejoice, to do evil, and delight in the frowardness of the wicked. Um, so uh, th there's there's really a lot more to this as far as you know. Yeah, some people are disagreeable. But being disagreeable and contrary like that, and just wanting to argue and, and have strife and, uh, and divisions all the time, is actually uh, evil, and it's walking in darkness, and it's really a, uh, it's it's really very serious. It's not something that, you know, I, you know, I think most of most Christians I know, uh, we want to try to have peace all the time, and I think we all desire that. But the Apostle Paul told us, uh, if at all possible, be at peace with all men. Now, if I understand that right, it, it, that means that 
if at all possible, means it might not always be possible. So once we understand that, then we just have to accept the fact there are some people that we stop trying to make peace all the time with them and get along and put up with them. We are not supposed to put up with certain things. And uh, if we do put up with it, then it's not wise. Now, now what about, though, when it says, and, and I, I agree, totally agree with everything you just said. I don't, don't take this as, as contradicting it because I fully agree. But what if, like, let's say there's a brother in Christ who's done some, some terrible wrong to us and we don't put up with him. They're causing divisions and everything. But then they come later and say, you know, I'm sorry, I wronged you. I, 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 wanna, I want to, um, to, to get along and stop causing divisions. Do we receive them back on the principle of forgive your brother, not just seven times, or 70 times seven? Yeah, I'd say yes, absolutely. The moment that someone, you know, within their spirit or conscience, you know, humbles themselves, that then we're forgiven straight away. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, obviously, putting it all together, all of these pieces, I think it, it, it says, let's be wise to identify someone. Uh, and let's try to be at peace with them. But once we identify them as Jesus, what Jesus called swine, okay, these are the people who don't want to listen. All they want to do is argue. Let's not waste any time casting pearls to them. We need to dust off our feet and move on. We name them and avoid them. And now, if they at some point uh, have contrition and say, hey, wait, oh, I was wrong and I wanted to, I want to, uh, to reconcile, then, of course, we forgive them 490 times and we want to reconcile. That's, that's how I see it. And, uh, Brother Sam? Yeah, of course. Um, you know, we are obligated to uh, forgive our brethren, uh, you know, whenever... They come to ask. I mean, Peter asks, "How many? How, how often uh, should I forgive my brother?" Um, now, as uh, Brother Luke has put, if the brother comes to ask for forgiveness, yes, we forget it. But uh, I don't think we'll be just forgiving for our, you know, sake of ego or, or you know, how some Buddhists do. They just kind of forgive so that they can feel better. Um, now, isn't there a sense in which, though, Sam, that we should have unconditional forgiveness and that we shouldn't wish ill on people, even if they don't say we're so they're sorry or whatever? Well, that would be very nice to have unconditional love, but we got to think about why uh, you want to do that. Even God is quite conditional as far as salvation is concerned. Um, that is to believe on Jesus Christ. That is condition. Uh, when we believe on Jesus Christ, you know what that means. That means we have repented already. We have changed our mind already. So uh, it is quite conditional. Uh, forgive, because why is that conditional? Why is it mutual? It's so that we can both benefit from that activity. By forgiving and by asking for forgiveness, there is actual and mutual edification between Saints. Now, regarding um, the uh, blocking people, I kind of differ with, um, you know, I don't block people. I suspend them, so to say. <laughs> I give them, you know, when I'm getting to, like, heated uh, comment exchanges, I just kind of suspend them, you know, suspend that moment so that we kind of cool off a little bit, and then I unblock them. Uh, because, you know, as, ha as we have read in this very chapter, because I know God is the one preserving me. You know, I'm not the one uh, persevering to keep my faith. I don't have to persevere to keep my faith because I know God is the one preserving me from all these "quote unquote" evil things. So I, I don't really, I'm not really afraid about you know confronting certain people or certain issues, but I do understand what things needs to be avoided because for example like I notice a lot of people who uh, kind of overestimate their faith to the point that they can they think that their faith won't be challenged and they tend to uh, love quote unquote reprobates over brethren and when 
I mean, Christ did hang around with sinners, but he didn't hang around with those who rejected God, uh, a.k.a. reprobates. Uh, and when you do hang around with that sort of people who have constantly rejected Christ, and you give gospel to them, they constantly reject them, you got to move on. You know, you cannot be just hanging around and hanging around there, because eventually, that sort of activity will defile you, defile your heart to the point that you won't even know that you're having So we, we do really have to watch out. Let me uh, give Brother Ronnie a, a chance here to talk again. I'm going to ask Brother Ronnie now to come back. We're moving on to the uh, this. Bill, could you get your sound? Yeah, uh, we're going to ask Brother Ronnie to comment on these verses first. I'm going to read uh, here at the end of this chapter. Um, now we're talking about not the froward man. Verse 16 says, To deliver thee from the strange woman, even from the stranger which flattereth with her words, which forsaketh the guide of her youth, and forgetteth the covenant of her God, so now we're moving from a froward man to a, a strange woman who is trying to flatter you with her words, Brother Ronnie. Well, I guess women like to do that. <laughs> uh, you have to excuse me because I want to go back to the last point. I heard something that I was coming back. Now, excuse me, I had to release the hound and, uh, in the moors of the backyard to terrorize the chipmunks. But I heard something about forgiveness. <clears throat> I'd just like to throw this in. I believe we should forgive right away. And it doesn't always come like with feelings. I don't think it's a matter of feeling good or feeling bad. It's uh, because sometimes you don't feel like forgiving this, um, someone. But the Lord tells us to forgive. And if we look at what we were forgiven of, that should make it pretty easy. Now, feelings may come later on. This is just my opinion. But I, I, I truly believe that unforgiveness puts you in a prison because you think about that other person, what that other person has done over and over and over, and that, the other person you know, probably doesn't give a toot about what you at all and isn't thinking about you at all, but you, that, that can really harm you. And uh, to me, it's, 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 it's a release when you forgive. And I think it's a good thing. Even, even if it's a decision first, do it. And allow the feelings to come later. Uh, as far as a woman goes, I, I don't have much to say about that. All right, let, let me try to differentiate here with, with two uh, related ideas. One is forgiveness, the other is reconciliation. Uh, I would say take what Brother Ronnie and Brother Sam said and identify them in that way. I, I think we should forgive people automatically without even them asking us for it because we're supposed to be forgiving and it's good for us because we're not holding on to anger and that's poisonous. Uh, but uh, reconciliation only happens, as, as Sam says, that certain things are conditional. Reconciliation has to be a two-way thing. So, but, so if, if, the, you've already, if I've already forgiven someone because I don't want to hold on to my anger, uh, and then at some point in the future, that person contacts me and says, says, says we, can we talk this out, and, we, and, and we, re, we end up reconciling, then that's a reciprocal thing. There's, a, there's conditions there. So that's how I would see that relationship. Uh, Brother, uh, Brother Jackson. You know, I, I'd like to add something to that. You know, I totally understand, uh, you know, where RJ is coming from, and uh, I, I totally agree with you. Um, and I, I take that as forgiving, meaning you are ready to forgive. You know, you have that heart to ready to forgive. And what what uh, Brother Luke is adding to that is that mutual uh, relationship. That uh, you know, that sort of you know, asking for forgiveness and 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 forgiving and giving hug and, and getting all that you know that tighter. Uh, you know, like when when Christ was talking about the uh, unforgiving servant, remember that parable? You know, the king uh, forgave his, ser his servant, and he owes a lot of debt. He forgave him, and what did the servant do? You know, he you know he just grabbed his friend, a, a fellow servant, 
uh, someone who owes a little bit of money, right? And despite the fact that the other servant was asking for forgiveness, this uh, unforgiving servant who just uh, got all his debt wiped away was not able to forgive him. He, despite the fact that his fellow servant was pleading and asking and begging, you see. So that sort of things we ought not to be, ever, ever. But uh, I totally understand where you're coming from. Forgiving, I think it means you are ready to forgive. And, and me, having coming from Eastern background, um, being Taoist and familiar with Buddhism, and the reason why these guys forgive is not to have that sort of, not to build that sort of relationship or that sort of edification, but rather for your own benefit, so that your ego can uh, be healed, so to say, you can be comforted. So when we are, when we say we are forgiving someone, or when we say we are asking for forgiveness, who are we doing this for? We have to ask ourselves that. Are we doing that for me? Or are we doing this for our brother? Are we doing this for that person who is asking for forgiveness? You know what I'm saying? So I think it's that, you know, uh, compassion, I think. That compassion they are trying to feel that person, where that person is coming from. I want to add, so I've said this numerous times recently because this whole subject has been very relevant lately. And, and uh, uh, this kind of relates to what uh, Sibylla has been commenting here in the comment section. Uh, I had a guy many years ago that was, uh, was falling out, and then uh, after years he, he came across me and he wanted to restore the relationship, and, and uh, I told him I couldn't. I said, I, I forgive you. I'm not angry with you. But the, but the issue now is, do I want to be your friend? And I said, I've, I've already got a lot of friends. I don't have time for another friend. And besides, if I bring you into my life, uh, it's going to cause a lot of conflicts between you and all my other friends that don't want to have anything to do with you. So there, even if we forgive, and even if someone wants to reconcile, uh, it doesn't mean that we're obligated to have a friendly relationship. I don't want to have animosity. I don't want to have dissension. But does that mean that person has to come into my circle of friends and do I have to give my time? Because the time I have is the most valuable thing I own. It's, it's, uh, uh, it's perishable. This last hour and 35 minutes, I can never get it back. I, I didn't waste it though. This time was well spent. Do I want to give future time to someone that I don't want to be around? Just because I'm not obligated to do that. Even as a Christian, we are uh, free to choose our friends. Even if someone's a believer, I don't have to be friends with them. I, I want to be cordial to them. I want to be respectful to them. But friendship, to me, implies I want to spend a lot of time with that person. Okay, uh, I guess we can move on. But anybody else who wants to say anything on that before we talk about this woman here? Uh, yeah, I, I only just thought the way that, that, that in regard to forgiveness, primarily it's for your own sake and your own conscience and alleviating pressure and stuff from, from yourself but it's also variable as well because i think you know god can help us and does help us to discern who is genuine and, and they really want to make amends so that, that, that genuine forgiveness genuine relationship etc can be restored so it is i suppose individual and a personal thing also Uh, Brother Ronnie? Yeah, I agree. Um, <clears throat> I don't think we have to be idiots. You, you know, you forgive to let that person go out of your life so you don't end up in that prison of thinking about that wrong all the time. Uh, it's, I, I believe like forgiveness is an action, just like Christ on the cross. <clears throat> that doesn't mean you got to go back and be their buddy, you know. I mean, you got to learn from, from from it too. I mean, if the person changes, uh, that's a different story. And if you, they can prove it, that's different. But yeah, I'd I'd say walk away from them. You know, we're not idiots. God didn't make us into idiots. Yeah. 
Okay, uh, now let me ask uh, whoever wants to first comment on this verse where now we move from the froward man to the strange woman. Now verse 16, deliver thee from the strange woman, even from the stranger which flattereth with her words, which forsaketh the guide of her youth, and forgetteth the covenant of her God. I'm not sure I understand verse 17, but uh, this is a woman who's a flatterer. Uh, I think the same thing could be true for men. Sometimes men are flatterers. Uh, but, uh, all right, uh, who would like to speak about the flattering woman? Well, I, I would only say that, I, I, I was only going to say that, that the flatterer woman, I suppose, is, is, is a picture of an adulteress in as much as not just physically, but, but spiritually, someone who adulterates and perverts truth, you know, and especially in regard to wisdom as well, because you, you got, you've got perverters, not only the gospel, you've got perverters of wisdom, perverters of truth, and, and, and I believe, you know, the, 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 the standard terminology would be an adulterer in that sense, so perhaps it's speaking in them lines. Brother Ronnie was going to say something. Go ahead, brother. No, I wasn't going to go there. It uh, says in my book that it's a seductress, you know. And I, I think uh, you know some of us guys in our past life, you know, we, we know what it's all about. They turn to it to get what they want, you know. Uh, yeah, well, here it's talking about, I'm sure, an Israelite woman because you've got uh, her teachings of her youth. So, yeah, we got to watch that kind of thing, that flattering. Even it says a stranger that flatters you. You know, they're out to get something usually. Uh, unless you know for sure they're a Christian. You, if you know their heart, that's something else. That's, that's what I always look for in people. I don't look for people, whether, like for friends, you know, whether they're nice people or bad people, I look for the spirit in them. You know, I can the Holy Spirit. You know, they speak Scripture. They can back it up with Scripture. Uh, you remember the Holy Spirit in you brings forth Scripture to your own mind and heart when somebody else is speaking to you. Uh, you look for God's truth in a person. You know, preachers, people, friends. <clears throat> uh, but some people you just gotta let go and get rid of. And I agree with the, the brothers earlier too. You know, on that too. Although it's, uh, you can really hurt or anger you. Now let me ask, let me ask everybody a question here. Uh, <laughs> I haven't had a lot of interaction with uh, Sabella, but pretty much everybody else, uh, I've interacted quite a bit, and I've always had a conflicted feeling when I've talked to you people, because I think so much of you, and sometimes I, I'm a little bit guarded because I, I don't want anybody to ever think that I'm a flatterer as it as described in Proverbs that's a person that's using flattery to, to try to manipulate gain something but on the other hand I don't want to be handcuffed and not be able to praise someone when I feel that they deserve the praise I, I've praised everybody here it's always been sincere because I want to encourage and I want you to know that I love you and value you, but on the other hand, in the back of my mind, I have this little thing saying, "Oh God, they might think you're just flattering them," and it's a little conflict I have going on. So I don't know if anybody else has dealt with that, but it's a, it's a psychological thing that is uh, I don't like. Well, welcome to the autistic world, Lou. Um, let me say that flattery, I think, doesn't mean it doesn't mean anything compliment exactly. It means um, it mean well. Well, it, it is compliments, but what I'm saying is there's some ulterior motive. Sometimes it's disingenuous compliments. Sometimes it's um, sometimes it it is genuine compliments. But there's some ulterior motive which I don't think there is with you, Luke. And one of the when I, when I said my joke, "Welcome to the autistic world," is you almost never know. Is this flattery? Is this is this this? Is this am I coming off as this? Is this, is this? And, it's, and it's a nightmare cycle to kind of be trapped in and anyway 
So that, that's why I said that, just in case anyone doesn't understand that reference. But my point about flattery, the serious point is, I think, it, Luke, if, you, if I was, let, let's say you had a Corvette that I wanted you to will to me, and I said, Luke, you are just the greatest person on YouTube ever. I have a YouTube wall, a Brother Luke wall with Brother Luke trophies like that is engraved as I've got the mo like I get a blue ribbon for the most comments on your video and whatnot and I tried to use that to try to get you to will the car to me or something that that would be flattery but but to say I think you're a great YouTuber and you're hosting a great hangout I, I honestly believe that and there's no ulterior motive and I think that's sort of what defines flattery if that makes any form of sense well I know my true intentions and you know, when you're, when you're talking to someone, you know what's in your head. But what we don't know is how the other person is going to look at it. And I'm always a little afraid that that person might be suspicious, that it's just sheer flattery rather than, rather than just you know, love and, and, and encouragement. Um, all right, let's, uh, I want to go on to the rest of these verses here, but anybody else want to say, if you respond to my Paranoia. I've been identified as a paranoid, you know, and an and autistic. Brother Luke, at the bar 16, I, I, I kind of highlighted here is the point is to deliver the from, you know, whatever evil things going on, you know. Again, I think, uh, you know, God is clearly trying to tell us, hey, you know what, we, you're gonna, you're gonna be preserved, you're gonna be delivered. All right, so to deliver the from. So any kind of thoughts you had, whether someone is flaring you, whether he's genuine or not, forget about that. You know, just trust you. Just know that whatever it is, you will be delivered. <laughs> My fear is not that someone's flattering me, but the fear that someone might believe I'm using flattery on them. Um, okay, uh, anybody, <laughs> anybody else? Uh, which? Uh, okay, let me read the end of this here. I think the rest of it's all kind of the uh, same uh, issues. Uh, to deliver thee from the strange woman, even from the stranger which flattereth with her words, which forsaketh the guide of her youth, and forgetteth the covenant of her God. For her house inclineth unto death, and her paths unto the dead. None that go unto her return again, neither take they hold of the paths of life that thou mayest walk in the way of good men and keep the paths of righteousness. For the upright shall dwell in the land and the perfect shall remain in it, but the wicked shall be cut off from the earth and the transgressor shall be rooted out of it. Uh, particularly this verse 17 is of interest to me because I don't understand it. So if anybody can help me with verse 17, I would thank you. The verse 17, I think, is talking about the uh, um, the woman, of course, when she was younger, and she probably had this promise of probably maybe she believed on God. And if you know, if I were to compare it to nowadays, maybe she used to be a Christian, or that's what she says. And basically, she's just forsaken that promise of God um, that by believing on Christ, we shall be saved. And that sort of very uh, fundamental uh, and the very love of God, I think that's what the verse 17 is talking about. I, I, I've got two odd thoughts on that, believe it or not. And I suppose we're going to have to ask for the wisdom of Solomon the godly wisdom to try and work out which one's right. First thing that comes to mind, you know, in regard to, to verse 17, it is Israel, you know, which forsake of the God of her youth and forget of the covenant of her God. You know, oftentimes Israel is described as, as, a, as, as a her, as married to, 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 to God in that sense. And, and Israel was forsaken, the, the, the God of her youth, the, the, the wisdom and the love of God, and forgetting even the covenant, even. So that's one one thing you know, vain I'm, I'm thinking of. And also you have that, that the portion in the New Testament, you know, where where 
that, 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 that God divorces Israel in that sense and marries another, i.e. in regard to that God divorces, that, that when you divorce from, from, from the husband who is of the law, you then marry to another, which is of grace. So I've got two pictures running through my head, but personally, you know, my personal interpretation of this is obviously we have verse 16, which is the strange woman, and, and through flattery that, that, that Israel has rejected, you know, the wisdom from God and rejected the covenant from God. This is my my initial thought of, of, of what that's speaking of. Yeah, I totally agree with that. That's uh, quite analogical as well, that verse. Not only it applies to, uh, you know, actual women uh, forsaking her youth, uh, and forgetting the covenant of God, the promise that she probably made with God, but also, as Sabella is talking about, could compare to church or even to um, Israel, uh, those guys who kind of forsaken Christ. If we, I think the, the question we should ask is, what is the covenant of, of, of our God? The covenant of our God, you know, so, I mean, we know what the covenant of God is. That's Jesus Christ, the promise. So that's what Brother Bill was coming from, I think, when he mentioned the, about Israel. Yeah, you could apply, as I said, yeah, you could apply it in, in New Testament terms. You know, obviously we know in New Testament terms, you know, if, if this woman... Is talking about the church and they're, and they're born again saved believers. Yeah, they're never going to be forsaken, but it's going to cause a lot of trouble in the in, in the intermediate for sure. Well, it's um, it certainly is a serious thing. As you read the remainder of it, it tells you the uh, dire consequences from um, uh, not being uh, uh, protected and on guard from this flattering woman that uh, it leads to all this kind of destruction. Uh, so uh, I guess if there's anything else to be said on these verses here, let's try Let's take this time, give everybody a chance here to kind of sum up today's, what we learned from today in all these verses. Um, what sticks in your mind, and I will go in no particular order, whoever feels led, go ahead and speak about it first. Well, I'd only, you know, I suppose I'd, I'd surmise it in as much as, you know, be as wise as serpents and as, as peaceful as doves, I suppose. You know, we have to have wisdom as well as peace. You know, we've got to combine the two properly together. And, and, and as I said earlier, you know, give someone the benefit of the doubt a few times. Uh, a third striker out. And, you know, but on the other side of the coin, that if someone is genuine, they want forgiveness and they're humble themselves that then we are to forgive them immediately so yeah that that's why i think it sums up beautifully you know be as wise as serpents you know really use your common sense and your godly wisdom but at the same time be prepared in humility and in love for the sake of christ for the sake of yourself and for the for, for the brethren to, to humbly accept a brother or a sister who has gone astray and desires to come back to the fold. If, if that was to surmise today's proverbs, I, I think that would be it. Uh, also, if I may add, you know, if Brother Luke, if I were to, um, let's say, flatter you, oh, Brother Luke, you know, what you do is awesome. I mean, the things that you say, the things, oh, boy, I mean, you, I mean, if I were to, like, flatter you and flatter you, and sooner or later, if you're not wise, then you'll think, wait, you know, I am good, you know, my works are good, you know, and thereby you may be forgetting the covenant of God, the work of, the work of God, Jesus Christ. I think that's the verse in, in, in 17 can be applied as well, in, you know, that verse kind of speaks to me that is against work salvation, so to say. 
I don't know if, if I'm getting it through. You know what I mean, Brother Luke? Yeah, yeah very, very good point. Uh, uh, is who wants to go next? Summing up there, what they learned from today, uh, Brother Jackson or Ronnie? Well, I'm kind of stuck in that uh, First Corinthians 13 a little bit today. <laughs> uh, but to go back here, <clears throat> it's uh, you know getting that understanding and wisdom. Uh, you gain the knowledge, let's say, with what we're dealing with lately, and you, from that you gain wisdom. You know, you find out who your brothers are, who your sisters really are. Or, um, and for me, the hardest thing for me is to forgive when someone attacks another brother or sister and actually threatens their family. I mean, to me, that makes me want to take the old uh, something else out goes into the flesh. Uh, but then it, when, you, when you talk to somebody who already knows and understands these things, has been through them before, you, you take their wisdom, their understanding uh, of how to deal with that. And that kind of melts away the garbage in you too because it's the Holy Spirit working like that. And that's what I got out of it. But I'm kind of stuck a little bit in 1 Corinthians 13 where you see through uh, glass darkly. <laughs> I'm still looking through. That's still in my heart. So that's about it. All right, brother. Thank, thank you. Uh, I also want everybody to know that when uh, we're going to do a, a gospel invitation here before we close, and then after we close the live broadcast, I hope everybody can stay and we can have a private conversation about anything that's on your mind. But uh, brother Jackson, what sum up uh, the, the study today? All right. All right. Sorry, I had to grab a package. If you called on me before, I just got here, but um. Today we learned about um, how God preserves us and how God um, wants us to react to people who cause divisions and, and strife and everything. Um, we, we learned a lot of things about the... What, what we, didn't learn, we discussed a lot of the details about how to do that, like Sam with the forgiveness and the and the um, like being in fellowship with them bringing them back but still you then you brought up the point Luke that you're not required to be somebody's best friend even if they're a believer or, an, or or even their friend at all if they're a believer and so we we sort of we're sorting out how to treat others including in hard situations and um, we also had an interesting little tangent on eternal security because of how I interpret the preserving in Proverbs uh, very well said, brother. Thank you. Uh, I would uh, just a very brief review. I think the key thing in the very beginning is to understand that um, in in Proverbs, many times the writer says, "My son, if thou wilt." Uh, he, he's he, it's like a wise father trying to instruct his son. Right. So we are we are supposed to be listening like we're the son. And uh, God wants us to have this wisdom, and so it says. This is our attitude. We should, we should uh, incline our ears for wisdom. We should apply our heart for it. We should cry after it. We should seek it as silver and gold. So this is the first thing that's um, of most importance: is that we need to uh, actually adopt an attitude that we will seek after wisdom, not only today. But continually. That's why the idea of reading the Proverbs every day, a chapter a day, 31 chapters, and then repeating it again, if you did that for the rest of your life, I think that uh, you will definitely be blessed and gain in wisdom. I and mean, then, of course, we have the benefit of being able to discuss it, and, and uh, we, we gain wisdom not just from the scriptures, but from the, uh, the, the other fellow believers that, uh, that may have an insight that I didn't have. Uh, I've learned, I got some insights from you today that uh, I wouldn't have seen myself. So that's the advantage of coming together and pursuing this wisdom together. And then the two problems that were addressed, it says you need to acquire this wisdom so you know how to deal with this froward man. And we've had to deal with froward men a lot. 
and, and, and then this idea of this uh, flattering woman. Uh, we need to be able to see through that flattery and, um, and not be deceived by it and uh, manipulated. So uh, that's how I would sum it up. And uh, uh, if anybody else has one, anything else they want to add before we go on to the invitation for salvation, please go ahead and say it. And then... Yeah, I'd just like only just to say that that I, I don't know what what, what it was in uh, one Corinthians for in that that, that touched for a runny, but for me certainly, I, I had a bit of an ouch moment in one Corinthians thirteen five. I'll quickly read it out, and it says, you know, we're talking about love, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not evilly provoked, thinketh not evil. And, and I suppose in my err as a human, I, I am easily provoked. I've got, I've got to be honest. I'm, no. I'm easy. Even the wife, has just, <laughs> the wife has just come out of the bathroom and said, no, surely not. But yeah, I am honestly. I'm easily provoked. You know, oftentimes I wear my heart on my sleeves. You know, it's advantageous in some areas, but in other areas it, it can be detrimental. But I think that that verse has spoken poignant to me, in that, that that sometimes I need to just keep my mouth shut, not think of evil, not seek of after myself, and, and certainly not behave unseemly. You know, I have a weakness there. I'm human, and, and I'm, I'm honest about it. That that's what I took certainly out of one Corinthians thirteen. Hey, I, I was just want to say that, uh, brother Bill, those were wise words. Uh, I I think that uh, we all are gaining wisdom, and so I, I really look forward to going through this uh, and continuing studying wisdom and learning together. Um, now, the, as we said last time, the, the most wise thing, the most um, um, prerequisite wisdom that a must have is they must have the wisdom unto salvation. And so I'm going to ask Brother Bill to, to tell anybody watching now uh, what's the wisest thing they can do so that they can, they can have eternal life in the kingdom of God in heaven. I'm going to put the real face on now, not the, the pretend sake face that I had earlier. Yeah, the, the best thing we do to become wise unto salvation it is, I suppose, firstly to admit that, that we have fallen short. You know, it, it, I'm trying to make this as brief as possible, but you know, the Word of God says that, that, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And sin just means to miss the mark. God is so holy and so way above us and so perfect that, that in our own righteousness, in all our good deeds and all our good works, we cannot we, we cannot get to that standard. And the word even says that even our righteousness, all the good things we do are as filthy rags to God. Not that we're filthy rags because God loves us, but all our works are as filthy rags because God's standard is so high. And unfortunately, the wages of this sin is death which is separation from a loving God, you know, and that, that is a problem. But, but, but thanks be to God that, 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 that this gift, though the wages of sin be death, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So despite our problems, despite our sin, despite our falling short, God loves us so dearly that, 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 that he was prepared and did indeed make payment for our sins 2,000 years ago at Calvary. You know, not, not because he had to, but because he loved to, because he loves us so much that he was prepared to come down from his glory and he was prepared to die for all our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day victorious according to the scriptures. And he done this not again, and I really must emphasize, it's not because of any good that we've done, but because he is good and he loves us very dear. You know, if we was to believe on those facts, as I've just described, and whom they brought, which is Jesus Christ, we could be saved forevermore. And that is, to be honest, that is a, the, the, the most simplest form of the gospel summary that I, I, I can actually give. Other than, if you really want to get so simple, it's almost embarrassing, but with God, he is simple to us, 
and, and, and sometimes <laughs> he's so blatantly simple that it embarrasses us that, that he loves us that much that there was a scenario in the Bible and that's recorded in the book of Acts where that, that there was a shaking in the cells and, and Paul and Silas were, were freed from the chains and, and there was a, a, a Roman guard, you know, and, and under Roman law, if, if prisoners escaped, they were to be put to death. And this Roman guard was panicking, yet Paul and Silas and all the other prisoners didn't escape and he wasn't going to be put to death. And he said, and, and this is the key point, in humility, he said, sirs to those, what must I do to be saved? Knowing that God has created a miracle, he must have seen that no one fled. You know that was that's, that's not normal behaviour. If, if if suddenly a prison was broken open and the chains were released, people would run in that scarper, and that 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 Roman would be put to death. But he see them stay there and stand with them, and he says, "Sirs, what must I do to be saved?" And they simply said, "Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved." How simple can you get? That is the love of God. That is a mercy of God this day. If you was just to believe that, you know, we're not proclaiming religiosity here. We're not proclaiming do's and don'ts here. We're just proclaiming that the simple good news that Jesus loves you and he desires that you be saved this day. And I would pray that you would just humbly do as that Philippine jailer and just say, what must I do to be saved? And the simple answer and resoundingly in the Bible, and resoundingly through, you know, the saints who would speak to us, genuine saints would say, just believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. You do that today, you will pass from death unto life, and that would be a most wondrous thing. And and I would encourage, and probably Brother Luke will expound on this in a second, that, that if you do simply, humbly believe, you know, what I've just said, and believe on this Lord Jesus Christ, that, that you would leave a comment on this page, that you would not only encourage us knowing that you've passed from death unto life and your brother and sister now, but also the whole heaven shall rejoice. That is the best thing that could happen this day. All said, all the, all, all the wisdom that Solomon gave, you could surmise in this. Just believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. i gotta, I got to say something. That... That right there, that beauty in that gospel that he, he gives out so well that the Holy Spirit is using him for. That is why hell's upset. upset. That is why he's being attacked so badly. I truly believe that with all my heart. Thank you, brother. Both, both statements so true. So, uh, that's the good news. Uh, anybody listening should be able to understand it truly is good news. That's why it's called the gospel. It's just a Greek word that means good news. So if you can understand that this is good news and you want to receive this gift of salvation, put your faith in Jesus. Let us know about it. And uh, Brother Bill said, uh, the angels rejoice, and we want to rejoice and celebrate uh, if you put your faith in Jesus. So uh, I want to thank the panelists. I look forward to next uh, Wednesday, uh, proceeding on to Chapter 3 of Proverbs. Uh, on Sunday, uh, I'm going to go back. Now that I finished the uh, last Sunday, I finished the, the study of uh, eternal sonship versus incar or incarnational sonship. Uh, so I'm ready to move on to uh, more character studies. And I believe the next character study, if we go chronologically, of the most significant characters in the scripture, will be none other than Noah. <laughs> so we're going to just start studying Noah on Sunday. I don't know how long it will take, but uh, looking forward to that. Uh, panelists, thank you. Uh, bless you all. And uh, viewers, bless you. In the name of our great Savior God, his name is Jesus Christ.